Hi, everybody. Welcome to the UBC Tianju Lecture Series in honor of Dr. Leon Hurwitz. I am Sherilyn Orba, and I am head of the Department of Asian Studies at the University of British Columbia, where our Vancouver campus is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I've been asked to say a few words about Leon Hurwitz and the Asian Studies Department. When Dr. Hurwitz joined our department in 1971, he was already very well known in his field as a polyglot scholar and brilliant translator. In fact, some of you have heard me tell this story before, but I remember the first time I heard his name when I was an undergraduate at a US university and I took a class on Buddhism in which we read his translation of the Lotus Sutra, the Lotus of the True Dharma, which had just come out a year or two earlier. I recall very little about my undergraduate life but I clearly remember the enthusiasm of my professor who called the translation astounding and a revelation. And I remembered those words when I joined UBC's Asian Studies Department in 1997 and learned that Dr. Herbitz had been one of the department's founding fathers and he taught here for almost 20 years. Dr. Herbitz was a towering figure in Buddhist studies and his lifetime of work continues to be influential today in Buddhist studies and beyond for example, in Chinese medieval studies and Indian philosophy. We're very grateful to his wife and children for their continuing interest in the Asian Studies Department and the way they have generously shared various items from Dr. Hurwitz's work, which can be viewed on our website. Leon Hurwitz really laid the cornerstone for the Buddhist Studies program at UBC, which is still thriving today, thanks in part to the amazing work of my colleague, Jin Hua Chun, and the generous support of the Tianju Buddhist Network. This support has allowed us to increase the number of Buddhism related courses taught in our department, to put on international conferences and has provided support for graduate students in Buddhist studies. We are profoundly grateful to Tianju for all the ways that it helps us to connect with scholars from all over the world. One great example of that being today's lecture, which I understand has attendees from all over the place. In conclusion, I'm delighted to welcome you all today um, to the lecture by Professor Wendy Ademek of the University of Calgary who will be introduced by Professor Chen. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, Sharni, for these beautiful introductions. And thank you, Professor Adamic, uh, for um, coming for these uh, lectures in honor of uh, Professor Neon Hurwitz. Uh, whom I have never met in person, but foods across the lab his uh, impact on the many pages of my <laughs> of my of my work, uh, literally literally pages, <laughs> and also I want to thank all of you uh, from all over the world for the, uh, coming for these lectures during this very difficult trying time. Uh, through this uh, unconventional, I mean, usually unconventional, but now it probably become a new <laughs> normal way uh, for academic uh, event. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, my colleague uh, and uh, also my development chairs, Professor uh, uh, Salin Opa has given a very good uh, introduction to Professor Harris. Now let me uh, introduce uh, our speakers. Um, Wendy Adam. Um, Wendy is currently is, um, a Lumata chair, very, very distinguished uh, position at the University of Calgary. But before he uh, uh, joined us in Canada, he has been, uh, he taught in quite a few universities, including the Iowa, and New York, Berlin, and uh, Columbia universities, and also uh, briefly at Sydney University. Uh, we are very happy for, <laughs> um, and also grateful uh, to uh, to uh, Wendy uh, for taking up this position in Canada. Uh, and this is, of course, very uh, significantly uh, strengthens uh, Canada's uh, uh, research is on Buddhist study. Uh, Wendy got all of her degrees from the Stanford, but she's uh, like uh, young Hurwitz. She also spent uh, quite 
uh, some kind in in Japan that also happened to be also happen to be in Kyoto. Uh, but he also uh, spends the time in other part of East Asia, including China. Uh, she's uh, a, it's very uh, well published. Her first book, uh, based on her uh, Stanford, uh, Stanford dissertations, uh, is a very innovative studies on uh, Chan Buddhism. Uh, the book, uh, of course, that many of you already know, is uh, the title is "The Mystic of Transition uh, of Trans uh, Transmission." Uh, it won a uh, very uh, award uh, for excellence from AAR. Uh, American Academies of Religions. Uh, as a twin book, I think she also uh, publishes a studies on Wu Zhu, uh, which was also a subject of her first book, but this is a very uh, detailed, very, very curious uh, translation, uh, translations. Um, uh, so uh, this is, uh, is a very um, provocative uh, studies. Uh, on uh, a very little long strand or gen pack. Uh, she is uh, currently uh, publishing uh, even, uh, uh, I believe that this is going to be even more um, uh, I, if a uh, very, very, uh, because she, she was uh, studies uh, Buddhism in a very unique way, and this is a truly inter uh, interdisciplinary study. And this time, this, she seek her focus uh, from Chan Buddhism to Baosan. Uh, this is uh, a, a very uh, a famed, uh, very very famous for <laughs> a Buddhist uh, a Buddhist art. Uh, so this book, I believe, is a very uh, unique title. It's a practice cape. Uh, I believe that this is a word that, um, a, created by Professor um, Adamic herself. So this talk uh, probably uh, reflects, uh, will provide us a, a glimpse into uh, this uh, exciting project. So now I would like to uh, invite all of you to welcome Professor uh, Azimik for her talk. Maybe in the meantime, if we can invite uh, Philip Hurwitz to say a few words. Um, we're very lucky that he is also here joining us as a legacy of the Hurwitz family. So Philip, if you would be willing to say a few words now while we're waiting, or uh, if not, we're welcome to invite you afterwards as well. Yes, thank you very much. This is great. Uh, it's nice to see everybody here and uh, it's a great honor for us. Um, I had prepared some words uh, in the inaugural um, lecture that uh, I wasn't able to say at that time, but uh, I'll read what I, what I wrote for that. I'm very pleased to speak at the inaugural lecture in the Tianzhu Hurwitz lecture series. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the University of British Columbia, uh, Professor Jin Wa Chen, department head, who at that time was Ross King, and the Department of Asian Studies, Dave Keefe and UBC Development, and the Tianju Buddhist Network for recognizing and honoring the legacy of my father, Leon Hurwitz. In addition, thanks to, of, of course, to uh, Professor Robert Buswell, who uh, spoke at that first lecture, but um, uh, looking forward to hearing uh, another lecture. Um, and uh, some of us who are here maybe knew my dad, and uh, I imagine that probably the majority of you uh, never met him in person, but uh, I'll take a few moments to give some background. Um, Leon Nahum Herbitz was born in, Cab in Cambridge, Massachusetts on August 4th, 1923 to parents Benjamin Herbitz and Rose Marcus. And he spent his childhood in Boston where he attended Boston Latin School before moving on to undergraduate studies in Chicago, where he majored in Latin and Greek. Um, Dad was drafted into US Army service at the beginning of World War II and attended Army Foreign Language School 
where he specialized and excelled in Japanese. He then went on to serve in the Allied occupation of Japan, and on his return to the U.S., he continued his studies, finally obtaining his Ph.D. from Columbia University in 1959, and that was concurrent with a position as an assistant professor at the U University of Washington. He married my mother, Reiko Kobayashi, in 1958 and had three children, my siblings, Hannah, who resides in Honolulu and is on it, uh, might be coming on later, I don't know. Uh, she couldn't be there in person in Vancouver, but now that we're doing everything remotely, uh, my brother Nathaniel and me, Philip. After many years at the UW, he transferred to UBC in 1971, where he taught in the Department of Asian Studies until he retired in 1988. And he spent the rest of his life, uh, the remaining years in Vancouver, where he died in 1992. Um, Many here are no doubt familiar with his scholarly achievements. Um, those who are not would be helped by reading the wonderful piece Sonia Arntzen wrote for his retirement, uh, which is available on the department's website. You know, my dad was a true scholar. Some of my earliest memories of him include the tack, 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 tack of the manual typewriter. He never graduated to an electric typewriter. He never graduated to a computer. Uh, and his apartment in West Point Gray was essentially a library. Uh, every wall was covered with books, uh, most of which were in languages that uh, only few people can read that many of. Uh, his desk at any time was strewn with half a dozen Asian language dictionaries, copies of the Manchester Guardian Weekly, Newsweek, Maclean's Deep Sight, Le Monde, and the Christian Science Monitor, which he read voraciously. You know his scholarly record, but my experience of him really was as a father, and I always looked forward to my visits to Vancouver and his visits to Seattle, during which he treated all of us with banana splits at the White Spot, Sunday brunch at the Hotel Vancouver, and Humphrey Bogart movies at the University Theater in Seattle. As a father, he was a kind, compassionate, infinitely patient, and we always knew that he put our welfare at the top of his list of priorities. I sure miss my dad. His almost unbelievably vast knowledge, his zany sense of humor. And I thank him for introducing us to a world of ideas populated with a wide range of characters, including fellow academic scholars, neighborhood buddies, and even Sakya school Buddhist lamas who gave us all Tibetan names. Thanks again to the organizers who are helping preserve his legacy as a scholar. I hope my words uh, will help preserve in your minds a bit of his legacy as a human being. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you uh, for these uh, wonderful introductions uh, from the professors, you know, Herbert's, uh, uh, one of the professors, you know, uh, Herbert's children. Now the, there's a uh, formerly overcome professors, uh, Wendy Adamek for her talk. Wendy, are you ready now? <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm, I missed the first part. Uh, my internet went out, it's snowing heavily here, and I'm on a satellite, so it could happen again. My apologies in advance if I, <laughs> if I disappear. But I'm glad that I caught the last part of Philip's talk about his father. Of course, I'm very indebted to Dr. Herbert's work. I, I used I used his work on the Northern Way quite a lot when I was uh, working on my first project. So I'm very honored to uh, be part of the Tianju Herbert series. And I thank uh, Professor Chen and, uh, the, and Vicky and the, the team, the whole team at UBC for inviting me to participate in this. Uh, so without further ado, I will um, turn to my paper. Uh, so there are slides and um, so we could go to the the first slide. Um, but yeah, that's the nice image that Vicki and the team made. In this talk, I'm going to read my paper. Um, you may see why as I go through some of the twists and turns. <laughs> I can't just talk off the top of my head here, but I will try to be clear. Um, in this talk, I explore resonances and disparities between 
existentialist and Chan or Son or Zen Buddhist probing of freedom and ethics. The longer paper is a chapter in my forthcoming collection of essays on relational dynamics, which is titled Anti-Entropics. Today's themes are doubt as evoked in the Chan practice of examining the topic, topic or kanhua, um, uh, both literature and practice, as well, and the phenomenology of ambiguity that Simone de Beauvoir explored in her early work, The Ethics of Ambiguity. I am fascinated with these works that enact a process of practicing ethics without recourse to claims for universal ground or the absolute priority of anything or attempts to minimally define a set of principles. The brief samples of Chan literature presented here are part of a tradition of commentaries on gonga, koans, as they are known popularly, or gongan, public cases, a practice that sometimes spans centuries as one master after another interrogated the koan and tracked another bend in the road or another cast of the dice, a, moti a motif that we will re-encounter here. More recently, existentialist approaches have been brought into dialogue with Chan, uh, Chan and Zen by postmodern philosophers like David Loy and uh, Jin Yong Park. But let us start with de Beauvoir's eloquent opening claim about, and this would be the next slide, about the common uh, exist, human existential dilemma. So man, in the parlance of the day, the pronouns were masculine, um, man knows and thinks this tragic ambivalence which the animal and the plant merely undergo. A new paradox is thereby introduced into his destiny. Rational animal, thinking reed, he escapes from his natural condition without, however, freeing himself from it. He is still part of this world of which he is a consciousness. He asserts himself as pure internality against which no external power can take hold, and he also experiences himself as a thing crushed by the dark weight of other things. At every moment he can grasp the non-temporal truth of his existence, but between the past which no longer is and the future which is not yet, this moment when he exists is nothing. Uh, so next so slide, please. I take up de Beauvoir's evocation of this moment when he exists is nothing as a distinctive voice from the turning point into modernity as I amplify its resonance with voices from the Chan tradition. The question at stake is, how does one reconcile reliable ethical practice with the ever-renewable freedom to engage in and as the lack of stable subject-object relations? Is it possible or desirable to be completely free from existential ambiguity and doubt while engaging in the world of more? morally weighted action. A key Chan or Zen claim is that the absolute disappearance of uncertainty is a result of true awakening. However, our existentialists would argue that at best one becomes free to make consequential choices within the tension of ambiguity. So the next slide, please. Uh, exploring these issues, my chapter in my book is structured in four parts. In today's talk, I will discuss the middle two parts and possibly, but probably not have time for part three. Um, so in the, in the chapter, I begin by identifying the aspect of Buddhism that is most germane to this exploration of resonances with de Beauvoir's phenomenological existentialism, namely subject-object co-constitution. Coverage of the extensive literature on phenomenology in Buddhism is beyond the scope of this talk today, but I summarize a pertinent example. Uh, Jin Yong Park's comparison of Maurice Merleau-Ponty and Pojotino. Park discusses their comparable deliberate use of chiasmus in terms 
a crisscrossing or inverted um, dynamics in terms of codependent reversals of the roles of questioner and questioned. So that's the introductory part of the chapter. Today, we turn to De Beauvoir and the first half of the ethics of ambiguity, discussing the meaning and effects of existential ambiguity. Then returning to a Chan context, I will discuss doubt uh, in a koan commentary by Chino, the famous master Chino's disciple, uh, Chinkok Hyesim. So these are the, that's the part for today. And then if we have time, I will go into a De Beauvoir's discussion of deployment of existentialism in action and Buddhist counterparts. Uh, in conclusion, I suggest that while existent, we, we can cut to the chase, <laughs> you can skip all this. I suggest that while existentialists and Chan practices both urge a commitment to freedom for oneself and others, as what oneself as freedom for what for others, uh, these examples demonstrate that their respective means of discovering and maintaining commitment cannot be readily reconciled. Yet both commitments demand courage of a different order than ethics of will or moralities of convention. Uh, so next slide, please. Although Simone de Beauvoir's lifelong partner, Jean-Paul Sartre, was uh, critical of aspects of the work of both Edmund Husserl and Maurice Merleau-Ponty, it has been argued that De Beauvoir's mode of engagement with existential ambiguity owes more to her fellow student, Merleau Ponty, than to Sartre. De Beauvoir and Sartre were also heavily influenced by Martin Heidegger, whose Buddhist echoes and influences have been discussed extensively elsewhere. One of the phenomenological themes De Beauvoir takes up is comparable to a fundamental Buddhist practice examination of the co-constitution or co-specification of subject and object, coupled with the effects of the self-delusional human capacity to project one's subject subjectivity as transcendental. Uh, next slide, please. So as de Beauvoir writes, it is desire which creates the desirable and the project which sets up the end. It is human existence which makes values spring up in the world on the basis of which it will be able to judge the enterprise in which it is engaged. But first, it locates itself beyond any pessimism, as beyond any optimism, for the fact of its original springing forth is a pure contingency. So ambiguity in her terms is, a is the gap or lack of specification that maintains the illusion of transcendental a priori subjects and objects or objectives. And this lack of specification is crucial to the project of meaning making. This is related to the notions of intentional arc and perceptual field in Merleau-Ponty's The Phenomenology, Phenomenology of Perception, a lastingly influential work that was reviewed by De Beauvoir when it first came out. Beginning with her early work, uh, Pyrrhus and Seneas, uh, in 1944, uh, De Beauvoir was engaged in articulating the ethics of authentic individual freedom in and as existential ambiguity with respect to the freedom of others. Her questioning of existentialism explores dimensions that are missing from Sartre's existentialist manifesto, Being and Nothingness. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the ethics of ambiguity appears to trace a dialectic. From exploration of the given existential condition of ambiguity operating in between absolute freedom and effective limits in part one, to exploration of amb ambivalence about this condition that leads to various form of denial in part two, to the conditions of a dynamic ethics of genuine freedom and responsible action in full awareness of the aporia of ambiguity in part three. 
The paragraph that opens her book articulates an existential condition of codependency. Quote, this privilege, which he alone possesses, of being a sovereign and unique subject amidst a universe of objects is what he shares with all his fellow men. In turn, an object for others, he is nothing more than an individual in the collectivity on which he depends. This is the basic condition of existential ambiguity. One experiences one existence as the sovereign freedom of subjectivity in the moment. Yet not only in this, this moment, nothing, ungraspable, one is at the same time constrained all abound, around by the facticity of being an object in a world of others. One is always at the nowhere, at the crux of things, the chiasmus of a freedom to will subjectively that depends on the unfreedom of objecthood. Yet this is also the condition enabling the authentic freedom of mutual disclosure. De Beauvoir's exploration of the excruciating experience of authentic existence sometimes seems close to Buddhist concepts of practice and sometimes irreconcilably apart. Here we can touch on only a few of these twists and turns. Uh, next slide, please. At each turn, De Beauvoir calls for the courage to live and act with integrity without any re recourse to seductive escapes. She says, since we do not succeed in fleeing it, let us therefore try to look the truth in the face. Let us try to assume our fundamental ambiguity. It is in the knowledge of the genuine conditions of our life that we must draw our strength to live and our reason for acting. Let me now introduce the key contrast with Chan, with Chan or Zen that will be further explored in the next section. As set in motion, uh, by uh, next slide, please. Uh, by Da Hui Zonggao, um, a different trajectory was charted for the course of existential confrontation in Kanhua practice. Robert Buswell, in his article, The Sensation of Doubt in East Asian Zen Buddhism and Some Parallels with Pali Accounts of Meditation Practice, discusses an oft repeated claim made by proponents of Kanhua practice. By staying close to the sensation of doubt, by tirelessly sustaining a sense of inquiry, one generates a transformative crisis that breaks through all doubts. Specifically, doubt is the existential experience of uncertainty confronted by the truth of innate original Buddha nature. Buswell, speaking for the Linji master Yuan Miao, says that facing the relentless stream of self-construction and contingency demands an equally relentless focus that generates the great fury required to breathe through doubt and clinging. Quote, at that point, the doubt explodes, annihilating the student's identification with body and mind. The body, uh, the bifurcating tendencies of thought are brought to an end, eliminating the limiting point of view that is the constructed sense of self and restoring the mind's inherent state of enlightenment. End quote. This, however, offers an immediacy and a plenitude, as de Beauvoir calls it, that she claims is impossible if one would completely embrace the inherent ambiguity of ethical action. <clears throat> Next slide, please. But it is also true, she says, that the most optimistic ethics have all begun by emphasizing the element of failure involved in the condition of man. Without failure, no ethics. For a being who from the very start would be an exact coincidence with himself in a perfect plenitude, the notion of having to be would have no meaning. One does not offer an ethics to a god. It is impossible to propose any to man if one does, uh, defines him as nature, as something given." End quote. <clears throat> she goes on to propose that existentialist commitment or conversion, as argued by Sartre, entails continual questioning. It means renouncing the desire to resolve the existential failure or flaw of knowing one's being as non-being and thus remaining at a distance from oneself. 
This, however, is the condition through which the world that is not myself presences, presences itself. She writes poignantly. Next slide, please. I would like to be the landscape which I am contemplating. I should like this sky, this quiet water, to think themselves within me, that it might be I whom they express in flesh and bone, and I remain at a distance. But it is also by this distance that the sky and the water exist before me. My contemplation is an excruciation only because it is also a joy. I cannot appropriate the snowfield where I slide. It remains foreign, forbidden, but I take delight in this very effort toward an impossible possession. I experience it as a triumph, not as a defeat. So she proposes this conversion as a kind of dialectic, but rather than indulging in the Hegelian negation of negation to achieve synthesis, the existentialist does not surpass his failure or lack of being but assumes it, continually realizing rather than dispelling the ambiguity. This means accepting that one never knows the world or oneself as a transparency. Uh, next slide, please. She says, existentialist conversion should rather be compar compared to Husserlian reduction. Let man put his will to be, to be in parentheses, and he will thereby be brought to the consciousness of his true condition. And just as phenomenological reduction pre prevents the errors of dogmatism by suspending all affirmation concerning the mode of reality of the external world, whose flesh and bone presence the reduction, does not, however, conta contest, eh, <laughs> whose flesh and bone presence the reduction does not, however, contest, so existentialist conversion does not suppress my instincts, desires, plans, and passions." End quote. This, of course, contrasts with the Buddhist claim that completely seeing into the conditions and functions through which the sense of self-existence is maintained will reveal both distance, duality, and passions to be codependent constructs or projections that lack any intrinsic reality. And this revelation will break the chain of their production. Here, with de Beauvoir, uh, quote, we may see clearly the inc incommensurability between the two modes of questioning. De Beauvoir would renounce any transcendental, any a priori or experiential resolution, and would consider it escapism. Her ethics of ambiguity does demand recognition of a certain kind of interdependence, but it is not Buddhist. Uh, rather than, uh, next slide, please. Rather than, uh, and this is not a quote, but um, includes a quote. Rather than co-emergence of oneself and as phenomena, she evokes the interdependence of mutually resistant individuals who do not vanish in the recognition of their separate but entangled nature. Quote, an ethics of ambiguity will be one which will refuse to deny a priori that separate existence can, at the same time, be bound to each other, that their individual freedoms can forge laws valid for all." End quote. However, her claim that, quote, to will oneself moral and to will oneself free are one and the same decision, end quote, seems no less utopian than the perfect plenitude of exact coincidence with oneself, or what Chan is in Chan uh, known as the sudden, uh, that she dismisses. So next slide, please. She at the same time invol involves herself in the same irresolvable conundrum to which Chan Buddhists pledge their fidelity, the con conundrum of sudden and gradual what meaning can there be in the words to will one their, oneself free, since at the beginning we are free? It is contradictory to set freedom up as something conquered, if at first it is something given. She even, um, end quote, she even interrogates the apparent contradiction in a manner that echoes the koan known as Zhao Zhou's dog, 
the famous Does a Dog Have Buddha Nature? She says, this objection would mean something only if freedom were a thing or a quality naturally attached to a thing. Then, in effect, one would either have it or not have it. So that is the impossibility that she is interrogating. In the final passages of her first section, she takes up the question of bad willing and the possibility of evil. Quote, if a man has only one, has one and only one way to save his existence, how can he choose not to choose it in all cases? Instead of saying, like Kant, that in the end he can't, the existentialist accepts that ambiguity entails infinite renewal of the possibility of making the wrong choice of being tempted by illusory solipsistic closure. Next slide, please. She says, only, unlike Kant, we do not see man as being essentially a positive will. On the contrary, he is first divine to find as a negativity. He is first at a distance from himself. He can co coincide with himself only by agreeing never to rejoin himself. There is within him a perpetual playing with the negative, and he thereby escapes himself, he escapes his freedom. And it is pre precisely because an evil will is here possible that the words to will oneself free have a meaning. Therefore, not only do we assert that the existentialist doctrine permits the elaboration of an ethics, but it even appears to us the, as the only possibility in which an ethics has its place. This, she argues, is because the stakes are real. The infinite ambiguity of authentic existence and its denials are not illusory or abstract. Uh, next slide, please. She says, Excellent existentialism alone gives, like religions, a real role to evil. And it is this, perhaps, which makes its judgment so gloomy. Men do not like to feel themselves in danger, yet it is because there are real dangers, real failures, and real earthly damnation that words like victory, wisdom, or joy have meaning. Nothing is decided in advance, and it is because man has something to lose, and because he can lose, that he can also win. This wager is far more dicey than Pascal's, but it has a kind of exhilarating immediacy. One can always choose. De Beauvoir concludes, quote, all errors are possible since man is a negativity and they are motivated by the anguish he feels in the face of his freedom, end quote. And this is also the only condition in which wisdom and joy have meaning. We will move now toward Buddhist pathways of victory, wisdom, or joy. Uh, after considering the dilemma of moral practice in a condition of individual original freedom in Chan context, we may probably not have time to return to de Beauvoir's questioning of the concrete challenges posed through actualizing a practice of willing authenticity. Uh, so next slide, please. We turn now to the Chan practice of doubt, the Chan Zen Song practice of doubt. So Da Hui Zonggao, as many of you know, is viewed as the paradigmatic proponent of cultivating doubt and breakthrough as a practice technique, as um, discussed by Buswell in the previous section. Famously, in a letter to a lay follower, he explains that the antidote to mere suppression or suspension of thought in meditation is to focus on the Hua Tao, uh, in, uh, the keyword, headword of a gongan, a public case, in order to break through doubt, a koan. He says, all the myriad doubts are just one doubt. If you can shatter the doubt you have on the Hua Tao, then all the myriad doubts will be at once shattered too. If you cannot shatter the Hua Tao, then you must still face it as if you were opposite a cliff. If you discard the Huato and then go and let doubts arise about other 
writings or about the teachings in the sutras or about going on by the old masters or about your day-to-day -day worldly worries, then you will be in the company of demons. So Dahui vividly evoke, evokes the transformative force and potential danger of making the Huato a po point of intense focus of doubt. The opposite of doubt is conviction. Unifying and shattering doubt breaks through to conviction of enlightenment. Dahui complained that Latter-day Chan practitioners did not believe. They had no faith in the actualization of original enlightenment. The most glaring doubt that presents itself when attempting to actualize original Buddha nature is awareness of one's ordinary flawed nature. In Chan context, this dilemma echoes the theodicy problem in Christian context. The Christian version, how can God have created such an imperfect world, becomes, in the Buddhist context, how can this be Buddha mind? Yet disbelief in one's truth is damning disbelief in the Buddhas. Next slide, please. Let us examine this questioning of the nature of enlightenment in connection with the famous koan known as Baijong's wild fox. Here we will focus on the, first the case and then the commentary uh, by Jinga Kiesim, who was Chinol's successor. So the case is in a Korean collection, but it is also known in numerous Chinese collections. The one I'm quoting here. So next slide, please. Case 184 in this Korean collection, Baijang's Wild Fox. Every day, Baijang ascended the hall. Each time, an old man would always listen to the sermon and leave when the assembly left. One day, he did not leave. The master thereupon asked, who is this standing before me? The old man said, I used to dwell here on this mountain during the time of Kashyapa Buddha, the previous Buddha. There was a student who asked, is a person with great cultivation still subject to karma or not? I answered, he is not subject to karma. I consequently fell into the body of a wild fox. Today, I ask your reverence to say a turning phrase on my behalf. The master, Baijang, said, then ask. The old man asked again, is someone with great cultivation still subject to karma or not? The master, Baijang, said, he is not in the dark, Bume about karma. At these words, the old man had a great awakening. So, oops, my page jumped. Um, it is often noted that the old man, the visitor, the fox visitor, sets up his would-be savior for the same fall he suffered. But Bai Zhang avoids the trap with skillful ambiguity. Bai Zhang's turning word may, dark, is multivalent and be, can be translated obscure, dark, evade, ignore, feign. And so the phrase has sometimes been translated as he does not evade or escape karma. In his commentary, Hyesim first establishes the question that the question is about a person of the present moment i.e. one is who is actualizing Buddha nature and acting according to principle rather than the original person or the universal condition of Buddha nature that may or may not be realized in action. This corresponds to some extent with De Beauvoir's distinction between the given condition of ambiguity and the person who chooses to act in full awareness of what existential freedom entails. Of course, as discussed above, in De Beauvoir's context, the breakthrough of entering principle, as, as, as uh, Chan borrows from Huayan, or an enlightenment threshold of disseminative change, uh, cannot be positive, positive, posited <laughs> for the existentialist. Um, he, so next slide, please. Hyesim's extended discussion counters two exclusive possibilities posed by a hypothetical questioner. 
one, that an actualized person is either subject or not subject to karmic effects. Sorry, the, those are the two possibilities, subject or not subject. He then presents the image of the fox as one who listens. So here we hear from Kisim. The old man answered that he is not subject to karma and fell into the body of a wild fox. Later, Baijiang said he is not in the dark about karma, and at these words he was released from the body of a wild fox. Why? The fox is a beast whose nature is to be full of doubt. When crossing a frozen river, the fox listens after each step to, from the crackling of the ice. That is, before he met Baijiang, the old man raised doubt and spoke. He therefore fell into the body of a wild fox. After he met Baijiang, the old man cut off his doubt and spoke. He was therefore released from the body of a wild fox. This image of a fox on ice comes from the I Ching, the Book of Changes, and its final hexagram, number 64, Wei Ji, the crossing not yet completed. This final hexagram is especially significant representing a turning point rather than a closure of the text. The I Ching could also be called the Book of Ambiguity. The guidance conveyed by its evocative images and phrases is notori notoriously difficult to interpret. In an I Ching-like manner, Bai Jing, Bai Zhang's not in the dark, does not evade, is not a guideline about how to act, but demonstrates the chiasmatic chis crisscrossing movement that enables one to act in authentic freedom. This freedom is not presented as freedom from consequences, but freedom from doubt. Hyesim says, the fox is the beast whose nature is to be full of doubt. When crossing a frozen river, the fox listens after each step. Hyesim goes on to develop the theme of raising doubt and cutting off doubt using poetic images to illustrate the Herod's breadth between before and after, or not understanding and understanding. He emphasizes the old man's pitiful condition and Bai Zhang's compassion, rather than the old man's fox-like craftiness and Bai Zhang's skillful avoidance of the trap. For Hie Sim, Bai Zhang's compassion exemplifies the ability to respond out of the empty chiasmus of self and as other that arises from freedom from doubt. Hyesim points out that this is the great matter at stake, not receiving a yes or no, or no answer. He says, whether you say karma exists or not, there is a path to free yourself. Next slide, please. Wu Men Hui Kai's more famous comment on the case from his slightly later Wu Men Guan, uh, Gateless Barrier collection, also plays on the chiasmatic potential of the turning word may, dark or evade. However, Wu Men stays safely within the indeterminacy of ambiguity. He does not commit himself. Unlike Hyesim, he does not raise the possibility of the catalytic effect of the old man's doubt. He alludes to Bai Zhang's state as an old fox who succeeded in making the transition, but the compassion of Bai Zhang's response is not made explicit. This is, uh, this is woman, more famous. Not falling under the law of cause and effect. For what reason has, had he fallen into the state of a fox? The law of cause and effect cannot be obscured. For what reason has he been released from a fox's body? If in regard to this you have the one eye, then you will understand that the former Bai Zhang enjoyed 500 lives of grace as a fox. His verse, Wu Men's verse. Not falling, not obscuring. Two faces, one die, one dice. Not obscuring, not falling. A thousand mistakes, 10,000 mistakes. This verse pivots on the karmic effect that appears once the die is cast. But while still up in the air, the playing piece is a nexus of choice. We might say that this nexus is both this chiasmus, X, choice, not two, 
and ambiguity, zero, not one. This is the emptiness and consequence over which the old fox walks with utmost attention. But what is the fox's nature? Wu Man's lives of grace suggest that this is a fox who is free from doubt and takes each step with hearing nature. The nature of Hye Sim's fox, on the other hand, is to take each step with attentive doubt, yet not remain frozen. Um, okay, so just back to De Beauvoir. Um, so the ch the Chan, what I'm calling antinomy in motion of grace and doubt that we just went through resonates with De Beauvoir's use of the analogy of making art and as, exa as an example of taking action as neither an end in itself nor a striving toward a rival, such that she says, quote, there is no longer a sharp separation between present and future, between means and ends. Yet for her, the questioning that is the means can never end. Both Buddhist and existential skillful means posit working for the liberation of others as a guiding motivation. But for de Beauvoir, one can never be sure if the end justifies the means. However, like the Chan masters, de Beauvoir resists the formulation of fixed precepts. She says, ethics does not furnish recipes any more than do science and art. One can merely propose methods, end quote. Unlike the Chan masters, for de, Be de Beauvoir, the crucial aspect of such methods is that although they have no Kantian formal strictness or universality, they are acknowledged to be enacted within particular familial, cultural, social, and national entanglements. In the abstract, this kind of enactment is easy to idealize, but very difficult to actualize in particular emergent processes. Each of the 10,000 things, we might say, is a sovereign intersectional subject of 10,000 errors. The only valid practice is to doubt and in the end to throw the dice. Quote, one finds oneself back at the anguish of free decision. And that is why political choice is an ethical choice. It is a wager as well as a decision. One bets on the chances and risks of the measure under consideration but whether chances and risks must be assumed or not in the given circumstances must be decided without help. And in doing so, one sets up values, which for de Beauvoir is a problem. She recognizes that the endless dialectical tension of the practice of existentialism will seem too exhausting and unappealing for actual practice in most people's lives. Moreover, dedicated practice of this evidence-based art or aesthetic science of meaning will only give victory to those who engage in no such self-confrontations and suffer no such doubts. So why not give up the struggle? In her short conclusion, De Beauvoir reiterates the commanding awareness of interdependence that is the core of existentialist practice. One's freedom can only be achieved through the freedom of others, the movement that springs from his heart but which leads outside of him. Next slide, please. She speaks movingly of the great feeling of calmness she experienced when reading Hegel in the library in August of 1940, which was three months after the Nazis had established a military dictatorship in France. Upon leaving the library and walking outside, her Hegel-induced calm evaporated and opened into unblinking infinity. She writes, but once I got into the street again, my, into my life, out of the system, beneath a real sky, the system was no longer of any use to me. What it had offered me under a show of the infinite was the consolations of death. And I again wanted to live in the midst of living men. I think that, inversely, existentialism does not offer to the reader the consolations of an abstract evasion. Existentialism proposes no evasion. On the contrary, its ethics is experienced in the truth of life, and it then appears as the only proposition of salvation which one can address to men. 
regardless of the staggering dimensions of the world about us, the density of our ignorance, the risk of catastrophes to come, and our individual weakness within the immense collectivity. The fact remains that we are absolutely free today if we choose to will our existence in its finiteness, a finiteness which is open on the infinite. So turning to the, a conclusion here. Articulating basic universal princi principles and precepts for ethical action, like the Eightfold Path, will always be an important human endeavor. However, ethics of ambiguity and groundlessness, as argued by De Beauvoir, De Beauvoir and demonstrated in the teachings of Da Hui, Chino, Hyesim, and other Chan, Son, and Zen masters, have also persisted as complementary reversals or upendings of practices defined by reified principles. The difference between our existentialist and Kanwa proponents is in their representations of what the practicing life is like. The existentialist quest to live an authentic life is a never ending endeavor in which neither despair nor joy are permanent and living with the tension of uncertainty and risk is a daily challenge. In contrast, Chan writings idealize boring into great doubt and the subsequent breakthrough of enlightenment as an opening to joy, which is once given to condition while practice continues to deepen. In either case, each must face its own closeted self contradictions as discussed in the chapter in more detail. Um, De Beauvoir's evocation of authentic life was articulated in the midst of affairs of her affairs with adolescent girls in the name of sexual liberation and justification of violent revolution for the sake of liberation of the working class. And as many have pointed out, Buddhism has its own histories and contemporary manifestation of support for violent regimes and tacit acceptance of sexual predation and exploitation of weaker members of the Sangha. Both, whoops, screen jumped again. It was shocked. Um, in either case, each must, each must face its own closeted self-contradictions. Whoops, I just read that, the screen jumped, sorry. Um, both existentialists and Chan forms of practice cultivate the lack of fixed ground on which to base ethics. For most people, this may not sound like an appealing condition to begin from or end up. However, both forms of art or skillful means affirm that this is a vibrantly living ambiguity in which to try to engage courageously, truthfully, and compassionately with others. One cannot slide over it, and one must cross it. As Wu Men said, a thousand errors, ten thousand. Thank you.